from Mark 25 and 24 then, and 30. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. She felt in her body that she was freed from suffering. Mm. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I want to invite you, if you have your worship guide close to you there, to open it. On the very back, you'll find a message outline uh, for today. I always provide a message outline as a way of helping you follow along. Uh, it's also a way for you to dive into the Scriptures a little better, to see the Scriptures. I'll be inviting you to, to circle some things and note some things today. Today, even number some things um, and fill in the blanks. But that message outline is provided for you to engage with in whatever, you, in whatever way you will. This past week, let me tell you a real quick story. I had a mother tell me that um, her child loves the message outlines and sits there awaiting those things to appear on the screen so they can fill in those things and just, it helps. I, it, it doesn't just help children, I think. It helps all of us really hopefully remember and let God's word sink in a little bit. And before we dive into to the message today, I wanna say a special word to the choir. Thank you for that gift this morning of just give me Jesus. Amen, church. Wow. You know, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm going to plug them for a minute, all right? They're looking for people. If you want to come and join them this summer, here's the deal. Two things. They said, you don't really have to sing. You can just make a joyful noise. That's fine. And you don't have to wear a robe in the summer. How about that? So if you want to join them, when you, you guys meet on Sunday afternoons, right? Two o'clock. They'd love to have you join them. They're looking for members. You want to join that choir and have some fun? I think you guys enjoy it, don't you? They would love to have you. You know, I think a lot of people don't know it. They don't, they don't realize it. But I went to school right up the road from here. I don't know if you've ever heard of Lee College. Now it's called Lee University. They stepped up in the world since I was there. In Cleveland, Tennessee, I, I, did, I was at the University of Georgia for Vince Dooley's last year. That was my freshman year in school. I watched him carry Vince Dooley off the field. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a Georgia fan. I forgot to say that. But anyway, uh, uh, but it was during about three, three quarters of the way through that year that God started to knock on my door. I'd been called since I was 13 years of age, and it was about going to prepare myself for ministry. And I was in music, and so I looked at music schools, Belmont over in Nashville, Lee up in Cleveland, and visited several schools, and it was Lee that I chose to pursue the rest of my undergraduate career. Well, when you go to Lee, it's a Christian school. Everybody has to take Bible classes. You have to take Old Testament, New Testament. You have to take ethics. And everybody graduates, everybody graduates from Lee, everybody with a minor in biblical education. Well, I'm an... I hope it's okay to say I, I'm a competitive person and sometimes an overachiever, okay? And I thought if I'm going to do all that work for a minor, why not take a few extra courses and make it a major? So I double majored. I was a vocal performance major and I was a biblical education minor and I studied Bible in undergraduate school. And I share that story to tell you this. It was right towards the end of my senior year in college that I took a class. It was on that Bible theology side and the class was called Systematic theology. Systematic theology is a class in which you think about all that you know about God and you try to put it in some structure, in some system, if you will. Don Bowdle, the distinguished Don Bowdle was the professor of that class and it was, I made it all the way to my senior year in college till I finally found that class. Have you ever been to that class before that you went to it and about halfway through you said, well, if I worked as hard as I could work, the best I can do is a B. Have you ever been there before? I was a sol I made a solid C in systematic theology. I'm just going to confess, all right? I made a solid C, but I learned so very much. Now, for many people, the idea of a system, taking all that you know and try to put it in some system is kind of a foreign thought. And I was only 21 years old. How good is a 21-year-old going to be able to take everything they know about God and put it into some kind of structure? But for our final thesis on that class, 
Professor Bowdle said this. He said, you must write a paper, and you can think about it however you will. But whatever you're, as you, as you try to address all that you know about God in one paper, you must have a central thread that, 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 that grounds it all. If you want to look at it like it's a spider web, and what is the one central thread that will ground the entire web? If you want to look at it like, like it's a house, what is the cornerstone of the house that you'll build everything that you know about God off of? What an incredibly challenging thought to give a 21-year-old, right? I know 21-year-olds, they, they think they know everything, but the reality is they're still pretty light, right? So I talked to some of my classmates. What are you going to put as the, the cornerstone of the house as you try to write this paper. And we all had different ideas. There were some people who said, I, I, my cornerstone is gonna be God is love. There it is in the Bible. That's a pretty good cornerstone, don't you agree? That everything that you would build off of that you know about God is that God is love. Another one of my classmates said, I'm gonna build it off of God is good. And everything else that I'm going to share that I think I know about God, it, it, it speaks into his mercy, it speaks into his justice, it speaks into his care. How will you... And at 21 years of age, I wrote a paper, and I want to tell you what I put as the cornerstone of my house. And I'm sharing this with you to invite you to think about what you would put as the cornerstone of your faith that everything else you know about God is built off of. For me, at 21 years of age... I pick that God is sovereign, that he's king, that he is a king that will bring his will to pass. He's a good king. He's a loving king. He's a king that is merciful. He's a king that is just. And I wrote a paper about how God as king grounds everything I know about who God is. And I, I wrote all about <laughs> at 21 years of age that I, that I thought I could know about God. And can I tell you, I look back on that moment and I think God was in that moment for me. Because at 21 years of age, I can tell you now as a, as a husband, as a dad, as a pastor who's, who's been in ministry for about 30 something years, I can tell you that the fact that God is king gives me deep peace. You know, the truth of the matter is in every one of our lives, struggle's gonna come, pain's gonna come, there's gonna be transition, there's gonna be all kinds of tumult. Jesus promised us that, by the way, right? But in all those moments, even from 21 years of age, there is something that has grounded me that in it all, God is king. He never slips off the throne. He never is surprised that the king is on his throne and that he will bring his will to pass. Today, we're going to read a scripture of a woman who was going through a lot of trouble. And this woman had incredible faith. But the reason I picked this scripture for today is simply this. You know, if you don't really ground yourself and understand that God is king and that God is sovereign, that the king brings his will to pass, there's a chance that you might go through struggle, that you might go through trouble, that you might go through pain, and one day just forget that. Just forget it and maybe begin to doubt that the king is really in charge. My hope for you is that even as we look at the life of this beautiful woman's story, that you would remember and see how God works through even the hardest things in our life. Let's look at this woman in Mark chapter 5. The Bible says a large crowd followed and pressed around him. Jesus had just gotten off the boat. He'd just been on a lake tour, if you will. And now there's people everywhere around him. And the Bible says that there are so many people. It's literally, can you, can you, can you picture it? They're pressing in, and it's, it's hard to move through the streets. And there was a woman there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Let me pause right there for a minute. This scripture tells us six things about this woman. You might want to just mark them in your margin. You might want to take a pen and number those things, but we just read five of those things. In verses 25 and 26, it tells us five things about this woman. Note those five things. The first thing it tells us is she'd been bleeding for 12 years. 12. I mean, 12 years? That's a long time, right? She'd been bleeding for 12 years. Secondly, it tells us she had suffered a great deal. When I read that, I, I don't think it's necessarily just talking about the bleeding that's going on. I think there's probably some psychological struggles going on, uh, emotional, maybe even relational struggles that this woman has had because of what's happened in her life. She'd been bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal. And then thirdly, she had been to many doctors. 
By the way, you've been there before? <laughs> you've been to a doctor, you thought, you hoped, you, you, you really hoped they were going to be able to help you, but in the end, it, 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 they, they might have promised you some things, but it didn't, didn't come out the way you hoped it would be. You know, for this woman, if you're really going to understand her story, she had been to many doctors. Imagine how many doctors have said, okay, now that's enough of that. We will get you better. We're going to take care of this now. And then another doctor came and went. She'd been bleeding for 12 years. She suffered a great deal. She had been to many doctors. And fourthly, she had spent all she had. She's broke. She's been trying to get better so much that she's dry. She's out. She doesn't have anything. And then the last thing here, number five, it says, instead of getting better, what did she get? Worse. I mean, what a plight. This woman is going through an ordeal. She's going, not just a short one. By the way, sometimes when you go through struggle and pain, it's not a short deal, right? Sometimes it can last an inordinately long time. And boy, it's in those moments that we begin to ask or ask questions, and sometimes they're not the best questions. I mean, what's the biggest question we ask when we're going through a, a spot like this woman? It's the question, why? Why? By the way, not a very good question because you're most of the time never going to get an answer to that question. A far better question is, God, what might you want to do through this? Keep reading with me. And the Bible says, and this is one of my favorite parts, when she heard about Jesus. By the way, that's just a few words. That, that, but can you imagine what she heard about Jesus? That there was this guy that was teaching about the kingdom of God and that everywhere he went, life was blooming and people were being, miracles were happening. Can you imagine the hope that began to burgeon in her? Maybe, just maybe, this is where my healing is. She had heard about Jesus and she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his cloak because she thought. And now we get to the sixth thing we learn about this lady. She thought to herself, if I could only touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. This woman had been bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal. She'd been to many doctors. She'd spent everything she had. Instead of getting better, she only grew worse. But here's the sixth and most important thing we learn about this woman. Even with all of that going on, she is filled with faith. Her faith is still there. She trusts that God wants what is best for her. She's not given up hope. Her faith is strong, even though the struggle has lasted and gone on and on and on and on. She reaches out. You know the story. She reaches out. She touches it. And immediately, what did that feel like, by the way? Immediately in her body, she knew it's over. She'd been made whole. She was complete. The bleeding had stopped. And Jesus knew power went out from him. I'm going to read the rest of the story in a few minutes, but let's pause here for a minute. This morning, I don't have seven points for you or five points for you. I just got two simple thoughts, all right? Two very simple thoughts that I want to remind you, especially, especially if you are going through your hard moment right now. If you've got your pen, I want you to invite you to fill out that first one. And the first one is this. This woman reminds of this. My problems have a purpose. God is in control. He's sovereign. He's king. And because I know that he's on the throne and he's a good king and a loving king and a merciful king, when I go through struggles, I can remember that God's in control and that he is going to bring his will to pass and that my problems have a purpose. Let me say that a little differently. Your life is not an amalgamation of a lot of random things that have happened to you. No, see, as Christians, we don't believe that. We don't believe anything like that. Your life is not a random series of events that have just happened to you. No, no, no. Not if you are a Christ follower. You know, the book of Job reminds us that he, Satan couldn't even come and touch Job without going to God first. I think one of the things we have to remember is that there is, there is this beautiful thing about your relationship with the king. Now get this, he's king. It's a big thing to say that God is king and you have a relationship with the king. That means that the things that come into your life, good, bad, ugly, indifferent, they come through, if you will, a God filter. Everything that happens to you because you 
are a subject of the king will come by some way of him allowing it. That may be hard for you to grasp. Now let me be very clear about what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. I am saying that your life is not a random series of happenstance, lucky chance things. We don't believe that. But what I am not saying is that everything that has come into your life is by God's hand, that he designed it, he planned it. No, 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 no. You know better than that, right? There's pain, there's war, there's abuse, there's death. There's all kinds of horrific things that God, God was not the author of. But what I want to remind you of is that no matter what happens in your world, the king can bring about his plan, his will, and his goodness. You know, Romans 8, 28, Paul's words say, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. A very famous scripture. Most people commit that to memory, but most people never read the 29th verse immediately after that. And verse 29 says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. We all have problems, and some of us lived charmed lives compared to others. But the reality is, for all of us, we will go through pain and struggle, and in those moments, we must remember that God is in charge, that he's the king, he's sovereign, and that he can use the problems that come into my life for a purpose. What is that grander purpose? To form the image of Jesus in us. Now, I told you just two simple thoughts. Your problems have a purpose. Write this one down. And my prayers have an impact. My prayers have an impact. They really do. When you pray, God hears. And your prayers make a difference. And so understanding that God is in control, when you bow your knee, when you humble your heart, no matter what you're going through, you are talking with the king. You're talking with the king. Jesus said it this way when he was trying to help people understand how much their prayers have an impact. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. This is Jesus' understanding of his father as sovereign, as a king. Listen, church, we need to be praying and asking and seeking and knocking this is important for our church. If you're a leader in our church, this is important for your family. If you're a mom or a dad, this is important for your family. If you're a grandmother or a granddad, I believe there is great power in prayer. Go, go back to this woman. She'd been struggling so long. How did she not give up hope? How did her faith stay strong? I am assured that it's got to be from her, her prayers. It's certainly not from the journey. It's certainly not from the doctors. Somehow the Lord has encouraged her in her spirit that when she hears Jesus is close by, what does she ask? What does she ask herself? Surely if I touch, if I could just, there's a faith statement there. If I can just touch the hem of his garment. You know, your problems have a purpose. Always, never, ever forget that. Always know that. And your prayers have an impact. What happened? Let me finish that story. The Bible says she reached out and touched Jesus. She was made whole. Jesus turns around to those around him and says, somebody touch me. Power just went out. And one of his disciples says, somebody touched you. Everybody's touching you. What do you mean? Jesus said, no, no, no. And Jesus starts looking, looking through the crowd for who it is. There's this beautiful woman, this beautiful moment where this woman does not, she could have, she could have tried to stay hidden. She steps out. She says, it was me. Jesus looks at her and he says some beautiful words. He looks at her and he calls her daughter. This is a beautiful term, a term of care, a term of nurture. I feel maybe, maybe in that moment, he knew her suffering and he knew the length of her suffering and he, he knew how she had held on to hope and to faith. And he looks at her with compassion and he says, daughter, your faith has made you whole go in peace can we pause right there for a minute we read that word and it, we just run, run right past it go in peace but in their understanding and even in the, in, the, in the Greek term that is there what he really was, what he really was telling her was go in shalom shalom is far bigger than peace, shalom is wholeness, it's, it's completeness see she had come that day by faith. She had touched his robe. She had fought through the crowd, and now she was whole. And Jesus looked at her and said, go in shalom. 
Go in shalom, he said. And let me read that. What did he say? And be freed from your suffering. Church, I'm so thankful to be your pastor. The one I want to challenge you, and you'll always hear me challenge you towards, for you to always believe in the goodness of God and in His greatness and to trust Him and to believe even when it looks like the odds are stacked against you, even when you feel like giving up, and maybe even when the pain and the heartache and the struggle has gone on for years and years and years and years. Always remember that your problems have a purpose and that God will bring good and form the image of Jesus in you if you'll allow him. And your prayers have an impact. As I get ready to close this message, I, I want to share a simple thought with you. I don't know if you've ever heard the name Karl Barth. Karl Barth is a famous Swiss theologian. He, uh, he died in 1968, but his influence was phenomenal. And um, Karl Barth, as a famed theologian, one time was giving a lecture in Chicago. While he was in the States, he was giving a lecture. And at the end of the lecture, he, he did a Q&A. And in the Q&A, a student raised up their hand and they asked an incredible question. It was, I guess, somewhat like my little thing about what are you going to build your, your, your systematic your theology, your faith on? A, a, a person, just a, a theological student raised their hand and they said, Dr. Bart, can you sum up all that you know about God into one simple sentence? What a great question. What a great question. And the, and the student was just hanging there wondering if this famed theologian would even answer the question. And Karl Barth did answer the question that day in Chicago. He said, yes, I can. I learned it at my mother's knee. And then Karl Barth, this phenomenal writer, theologian, global voice, said these words. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. When I first heard that story of Karl Barth, I'll never, I'll never forget it. Because I thought, what a phenomenal... He could have gone to so many things. This, this phenomenal mind, he could have thought about all these things he knows about God. But he brought it down to just this simple, simple thing. Why, why, have I, why am I sharing that with you? Because it caused me to reflect on my childhood. You know, I know I told you at 21 that I was thinking about God as king. And I was thinking about my theology. But I think some of the deepest theology happens in the home. It happens at the kitchen table. It happens from our mothers and our fathers and our grandmothers and grandfathers growing us up in the faith. And as I thought about it, I, I, I'm not Karl Barth. I'm not nearly as smart or as wise or as talented. But I, thought, I started to think, can I sum up my theology in one simple sentence? I don't know that it's perfect. It's probably not. But I want to tell you the answer that I came up with for me. At my home, every time we had a meal, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, we said the same prayer. Nobody prayed special words different every time. We all said it out loud, wrote every meal. And I bet somebody in this crowd, you probably prayed the same prayer or something like it when you were growing up. We would say this little prayer. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for this food. By his hands we are fed. Thank you, Lord, for daily bread. Every meal, every meal we said that same. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for every full voice around the table. Can I tell you that I think, I didn't realize it at the time, I think it's some of the greatest theology about God as king. I learned sitting at the breakfast table and the lunch table and the dinner table. God is great. And God is good. He is a great king. He is a good king. Oh, church, no matter what you go through, never, ever forget that. If you happen to be here today, and you've never, like this woman, placed your full faith and trust in Jesus for you to be made eternally whole. I'd invite you just as simple as asking the Lord Jesus to come into your life, confessing your sin, and believing that God loved you so much that he sent his son into the world. You can do that now. I invite you to pray with me, if you will. God, thank you so much for your love and your grace. Where would we be without it? Thank you that you love us so much that you sent your son to show us the way. And thank you so much, God, that because we have placed our faith and we place our faith and trust in Jesus that you can remove our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. Oh, God, thank you for salvation and thank you that you can now call us daughters and sons of God. God, help us no matter what we go through to always put our faith and our trust in you. 
Though the, though the times change, though the, though the storms come, God, we will trust in your goodness. We will trust in your greatness, that you are the king and that you will bring your goodwill to pass in our lives. Lord, help us, even in this day, to have shalom in our lives. Your wholeness, your completeness made from your touch, your forgiveness. And God, help us to give shalom to the world. We thank you for your good word in our lives, Jesus. Help us to follow you close and always put our faith and trust in a good and in a great king. We pray this in your most holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen, church.